This episode has some serious and potentially upsetting content, so it's recommended for mature audiences only. Coming up on the Outside of Sunday podcast. Frightening. So my mum was a monster. I grew up with a monster and my mum used to beat me like a man. Yeah, so once a month I would shoplift to get my clothing. Once a month I would go and shoplift from the local dairy to get my toiletries and stuff. Robbing people's clotheslines because my mum never bought me any, any undergarments. My mum never bought me any clothes that was dipping into her beer money. I became a compulsive thief. In in my chaos, in my mess, God was there. And I found these things coming out of my mouth and I forgave my mum. And so about three days later, I was able to catch up with her. And I said, hey, mum, I've forgiven you. And she said, what? And I said, oh, I just want you to know I've forgiven you. I've got to go. I think about, you know, the the things that I have to forgive in my life and the the people who have wronged or hurt me in my life and you know, it, it really pales in comparison to what you had to deal with and what you had to forgive. But yet Christ did that work in your life and in your heart to be able to forgive. And like you were just smiling just then when you said, oh, I've forgiven you. And you're so light and so free about it. And that, I mean, I feel like that's evidence of God. You know, like that is absolute yeah. evidence of the work of God. Hey, you're listening to the Outside of Sunday podcast. Is your faith stuck on Sunday? Christianity was never meant to be constrained to a weekly church service. I'm Krista, and here you'll find discussions on the Bible, mum life, and of course, how to live your faith outside of Sunday. Welcome to this episode of the Outside of Sunday podcast. I'm so happy to be here on Zoom with Winnie McClatchy. Um, Thank you so much, Winnie. I know we tried a couple of times to get this to work and Zoom was just like the best option. And I'm here like, you can't see it, but I'm wearing like my comfy PJ pants and like I've got the slippers down there. (laughs) So this is like a perfect situation in a way. (laughs) So thank you, Winnie. I I figured since we have so much to talk about and so much for you to share, I thought we'd just start by just throwing it to you and maybe you could just take us to the beginning. Um, I know you spent part of your young life in Kauro, which is between Rotorua and Fokotane um, inland. And was that where you were born or did you move there at some point in your childhood? How did you come to be in Kauro? Uh, my, I was born in Mutapara which is a, a little, a very small town, uh, about 45 minutes from Rotorua. And I was, we then migrated to Fakatani, and then I grew up in Etchkin. But uh, about 23, 24 years ago, my parents decided to migrate to Kaurau because they lost their house to a mortgage sale. So that's how we ended up in Kaurau. Okay. And what was your childhood like? It sounds like you moved around a lot. I had a very broken childhood, so oh. both my parents were broken. Uh, my dad was a drug dealer um, and he was a survivor. My mum was a drug dealer. She was the survivor. She was an alcoholic. So um, poverty, we were poverty stricken. So that was our, uh, that was my upbringing. Is, is that the reason why you guys moved around a lot? Just um, No, there wasn't. Went. No, there wasn't the reason why we moved around. Um, we were living in Fakatani. And my dad was always on PD and my mum spent a lot of time in Etchkin. So they were always drinking there with their friends. So it was just uh, hands in hands for hands in hand for us to move to Etchkin and um, live right next door to the party house. Mm-hmm. And was yeah. it, a, even though you were in poverty, would you describe it as a happy childhood or how how was that for you? Uh, it was frightening. So my mum was a monster. I grew up with a monster and my mum used to beat me like a man. And she, I was, I was a servant. So uh, when she started having children, when I was 10, she started popping up babies. I became the other parent because my dad was either in PD or periodic detention, or he was in prison and, or he was off because my mum had thrown him out. So I had to take the role of fitting my dad's shoes that I couldn't fit and help raise the kids, run the house. So my mum would disappear days on end and I would be there to take over. Wow. That's pretty strong language to describe your mum as a monster. That must have been a very sad and um, stressful, intense childhood. Um, So there wasn't really much love in that house. No, my mum didn't know how to love. I don't recall a time in my childhood that my mum ever told me she loved me but my dad told me he loved me so there was some love there coming from your dad that's nice at least yes. yeah so my dad told me he loved me um, when I had to run and go to my hideout house which was my nana's 
she told me she loved me but when I had to go back to my mum's she was just a plank so your hideout house was is that where you went to kind of get away from your mum um yep so if my mother was beating me if my mum was beating me or if she was being severely um abusive then I would run to my nana's and I was able to stay there but then my mum would ring and tell me that I had to go home so maybe weeks on end yeah and then I'd have to go home which I didn't like going home no I can't imagine that you would how how long did that go for was that your whole childhood or was there a point where it, it, it stopped or was it just continual oh yes it was continual so my mother um she had a good day she had her bad days um on the good days uh I didn't get beaten on the bad days I was walking on each each shelf so she would randomly throw something at my head she would um one of the beatings I got she dragged me into the garage she smashed a bottle and she stabbed me in the eye oh my goodness Winnie how old were you yeah and she told me I was I was 10 and she told me that I wasn't allowed to sleep on the floor because I didn't oh I wasn't allowed to sleep on the bed because I didn't deserve to and I had to sleep on the floor the next day my eye I couldn't see out of my eye it was crimson red and she said if you tell your dad you're going to get worse and my dad walked inside he looked at me and he said go to your nana's and because for to go to my nana's it was like a five minute run so I had no problem running to my nana's I was like yes yeah and so my nana was a creature of habit so my nana was very European she was uh, very well off very poshy and so there were rules you know and uh, I loved the routine at my grandmother's I slept in a beautiful cozy bed she would she was my alarm clock in the morning the shower was running everything's all heated up Her breakfast is at the table lunch is made for me I feel like a princess I'm treated well there's no swearing at me my European grandfather was just so European and loving <laughs> yeah so I, I loved I loved it <laughs> mm-hmm. so I suppose that was your safe place so that's that's why you called it your hiding place I guess yeah very much so very much so it was yeah very much so Mm. And when did you finally leave home? I suppose you must have been desperate to get out of home. I would have been, that's for sure. So I ran away. I ran away from home uh, when I was 12. And then I got busted um, because I was hiding in Edgecombe. Mm. Um, It's it's someone at a Jehovah Witnesses house because I knew my family would never go to a Jehovah Witnesses house and try and find me. And then I was riding down the road on their bike and uh, my parents my parents rode, uh, drove right up next to me and said, take the bike back and get home. And so that was it. My uh, my little trip was over. And then I ran away again when I was 14 and then again when I was 15. Wow. And did you have during that childhood, I mean, that must have been such a, well, you wanted to be saved from that situation. You were trying to save yourself by running away and by going to your nans when you could. I suppose you were desperate to be saved. Did you have any kind of concept of a saviour? Um, my dad used to, I used to hear dad talk about God all the time while he was puffing on a bong, while he was rolling joints, while he was stealing in weed. And um, then he would give me a hiding and say that it was in Jesus' name. And so I thought, you know, if that's the God that you serve, he can go and get stuffed. I don't, that God's a fraud. That's what I thought. I thought, why would a God let me be in this situation? Yeah, I must have. And I, this is what I, this is, I remember looking at the sky one night and I said, I must have done something really bad in my past life to end up with a, you know, to end up like this. And I was, I was 14 at the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, it's so strange because I, at this point you think here's my dad he's the one who's not going to be beating me he's the one who's the kind one who's told me he loved me and then he goes and he does that in Jesus name which I I find quite strange and obviously just terrible (laughs) like that is not the example of Christ at all that we find in the word but how are you to know that as a 14 or 12 year old girl yeah my it's funny because my parents, uh, they, 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 my dad's mother was a pastor and his um, real mother was a Christian. 
and then but it was my mum I think my mum was more of an atheist but when they're in their early 20s when I was a baby they were both saved and they came to Christ but my mum um she was uh she would always manifest with demons she would try and kill us um even driving even driving to church was a mission so she would try and drive us off the road into the river she would accuse my dad of trying to have affairs with, you know, the young teenage girls in the church. She would go around smashing all the windows to the house. Wow, that's... And my mum, so my mum's upbringing was, was horrendous. My mum was tied up like a dog naked under the house. Yeah, my mum had a, you know, my mum had a really horrendous um, upbringing as well. That just makes me so much more thankful. I mean, I know the end of your story and that you are now living in a completely different life and your children have a completely different mother because of the grace of God. And it breaks my heart to think of what you went through, honestly, Winnie, and um, even your mother, like it doesn't excuse her behavior at all, but I'm still like my heart breaks for her as well. So, um, wow, that's just insane. Um, So it's funny because I've just been learning about my real, my paternal grandmother, my mum's real mother. I never really ventured there because I heard a lot of horrible stories. And my mum said that when she was 11, um, she was being sexually abused. And her mum said to her, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. And then I'll kill myself. And I was like, who says that to an 11 year old? Yeah. But when I was talking to one of my cousins and my auntie, that she said the exact same thing to them. Wow. So I was like, whoa. And yeah, and just, you know, all, because um, lately we've been dealing with sexual abuse, you know, and how back in the 80s it was all swept under the carpet. And I swore to myself when I started finding these things out about my mother's my mother's childhood that I would never sweep those things out, you know, under the carpet. I would deal with them. They would be dealt with mm -hmm. because I don't want those things to be gener generationally passed down to my children or their children or their children. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to talk about it. Otherwise, it continues or otherwise these poor children who have no concept of of right or wrong because they're looking to the adults to tell them what is right or wrong they think they're the wrong ones and that they've done something wrong just like you when you were little and thinking oh I must have done something wrong to deserve this horrible life that my my mother is abusing me my father he says he loves me but in Jesus name he beats me and I just have a small glimpse with my nan you know like it's just yeah that's that's not <laughs> we don't want that to continue and so we need yeah. to be very um you know, like there is no shame and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think bringing these things out that some people see at them as shameful, we're bringing it to the light and there is no shame in that. And That's so right. I commend you for being so honest and so open, Winnie, because, yeah, we we cannot have these things continue. And, and you're right, it can be generationally passed down and... And then who knows how long it will go for. And, uh, you know, like right. I commend you, honestly, for having the strength to be the one to say, no, this ends yep. with me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, well let's, um, let's, let's carry on. So, so in your childhood, you're experiencing all this awfulness, basically a torturous, uh, was that the right word? A very tormented childhood. Absolutely. And then you had that moment where as a little girl, you said, there is no God. Would you describe yourself as feeling like an atheist at that point? I just, <clears throat> I just didn't believe in what they were saying. And they didn't, there were no fruits of this talk of this God. I just knew that my mum was a monster. She was an absolute cow. And my dad was just most of the time never there. They were always drunk. And I just, yeah, I just, I just didn't believe I didn't believe that God was real mm -hmm. so um hence why you know when I was eight was my first attempt of suicide at eight years old at eight years old yeah do you want to talk about life, that? Well, life was life was tough with my mother life was horrible with my mum she was a ugly drunk and if that if she wasn't drinking then she was fighting so what does that look like for an eight-year-old though was it a, a violent thing or was it just a thought I want to end my life um it was just a <clears throat> no I I 
remember walking into the wash house and I sat down and I just thought these look dangerous. I remember looking at all the, all the detergents and, you know, all the, I don't know, what do you call them? Like bleach um, and stuff. Yeah, you know, like bleaches and stuff. And I just thought, surely. And so I started drinking, I, I started, I started trying to drink them, but nothing happened. Yeah. So that, but I was attempting to drink them to die. And was that something that continued in your life? Did that suicidality continue or was that just that one time when you were eight? Uh, no, I attempted suicide many times in my life, but um, I would, it just wouldn't happen. And the worst was uh, 20 years ago, um, I attempted to commit suicide um, when I was seven months pregnant. Sorry, eight months pregnant. So I just found out I was pregnant. I was seven months pregnant. I had only just found out, didn't know I was pregnant. And then my partner at the time, he cheated on me. I had never, ever been cheated on. I was 23 years old, never cheated on. And I just, it was the worst feeling. I did the cheating. I was the wretched person. And suddenly it was done back to me. It hurt and I couldn't cope to the point where I had to tell the neighbor, ask the neighbors, can you come and get the knives and stuff out of the out of the house because I'm going to hurt myself. So they did. I ended up, okay, this is going to be a funny story. I ended up popping 70 pills I found in the bathroom cabinet. They had, it had no label, they were orange, and I just thought, okay then. So I had, so I sat down, I counted them, and then I swallowed them all, and they turned out to be laxatives. So three days later, I was still sitting on the toilet. <laughs> I thought you were going to say vitamin C tablets or something. No, no, they were laxatives. <laughs> Oh my and my God. son, my son, he is my son. He is very healthy, and he is twenty. <laughs> He's twenty next month. Well, well yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that <laughs> they were laxatives. <laughs> not yeah, but else. my the last attempt, the last attempt was in 2011. I had popped forty something, um, seventy meg uh, tablets, and I should have died, or I should have had some kind of organ failure. The reason I say that is because I know a couple of people that have taken the same pills and they ended up with um, renal failure and they're both died now. And I just, nothing happened, but I just knew from that day on that I just, I remember saying out loud, there must be a God and you must be real because I haven't died. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. And I said, you know what, that's it. I'm never going to do that again. And so in 2011, I was the last time I attempted the la the first and well the last time I attempted trying to take my life. Wow, well, I'm glad. And I just knew there's a reason. Some someone has a plan and a purpose for me. Mm -hmm. Someone has a plan and purpose for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Well, you God loves you. God doesn't want you to do that. God doesn't want you to waste your life. So I'm I'm so that's glad that right. all those attempts failed. Um, well, the funny Jesus. thing is. The funny thing is, is 2011 was one of the worst years I found out my dad had cancer, all sorts of things. But I, I remember one night I had a, I was in a, in a lesbian relationship and I, well, bisexual relationship, I should say. And I was um, sitting there with her and I felt, I smelt this fragrance in the house. And I said, did you spray some perfume? And she goes, no. And I said, are you sure? And she goes, yes. And it was the most beautiful fragrance I've ever smelt in my life and then someone said to me that was a heaven that was a heavenly smell that I smelt and I've never smelt anything like it to this day and I remember wow. the fragrance wow in my chaos in my mess God was there mm. yeah and, and I'm wondering like even though um your parents were far removed from Christianity you know their it sounds like you your grandparents one of your grandparents was a pastor is that correct yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering, like, maybe someone was praying for you. You may not have known that, but maybe there was somebody. Well, I found out, I found out later on that my two nanas prayed for me. I had two praying grandmothers, and I was so severely broken, and I was in such dark places, and I didn't know that these two women were covering me in prayer all the time. I'm named, I'm, I'm actually named after one of them. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. They're Prayer Praise is powerful. No prayer is wasted prayer. And I'm yay, so so thankful for that. Oh, I think uh, yeah, well, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful because you know, I mean, I thought I was always alone. Mm -hmm. I literally lived a low a life of loneliness. I didn't trust anybody. I couldn't, I always kept everyone at arm's length. And here I had two nanas that were praying for me and covering me in prayer. It's the most beautiful feeling when I think about it. Yeah, that is beautiful.
Um, all right, let's just hold that thought for a moment. If you're enjoying this episode of the podcast, please make sure you like, subscribe, leave us a comment and a five-star review. Now back to the episode. Um, do you think, let's go back now to when you were a bit younger. Do you think that your atheism shaped your life choices that you made from that point on after you kind of declared yourself as a little girl that there is no God, you were having such a rough time. Do you think that those that kind of decision of atheism shaped the life choices that you made? Uh, yes, I remember as a um, I remember as a young teenager, um, just how sad I was. I was miserable. I was unhappy. I was so depressed, and I had no time to be depressed and unhappy because I had so many things to do. So yes, it did. I ended up going to the library, the school library, and I started reading about Satanism and witchcraft and demons. And I started hunting out about tarot cards and, you know, divination and all those things. I started learning about seances and astrology and mythology and all those things. Mm, it's interesting. And then I started, and then I started, and then I started, um, and then I started experimenting with seances, experimenting with witchcraft, casting spells, things like that. Mm. That's interesting because most atheists, people who say, you know, like in their heart that there is no God, they also think there is no spirituality. But it's interesting that you went down that path. It's almost like you rejected God, but in, but. You or I don't know if you did. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like it's almost like you rejected God. You knew He was there though, but you were almost wanting to become like an enemy of God, and because you were angry at Him. Does do you think that bears any Just truth? Mm. Just spot on. I was so angry at God. Mm. How could He? How could He give me this life? How could me allow? How could He allow me to have this stink mum? How could He allow me to be born into poverty? We didn't even have a front door. That's your fault. You know, I hate you, God. That was my mentality. I hate you. And so I remember one day, uh, my mum and dad, they took me to a prayer meeting with Bill Sabrisky. And I, you know, and they were like, oh, our daughter needs prayer. And so here they are, you know, acting like they're righteous Christians when really the night before they were on the purse, you know, drinking or whatever. And then I ended up um, standing there and I remember he stuck his hand on my head and I remember crying out to Satan. And I was crying out so loudly to Satan. And then he, and then um, Bill Zabriskie said to my parents that she's got a demon that only she can get rid of. And so I had my first encounter with uh, with King Jesus when I was 19 years old and I was half drunk. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How did you get into that? Is, is that like your salvation moment or did that come later? <laughs> Yeah, so that was, you know, um, it's funny because I, I was in a Christian youth group. So growing up, I, I don't even know how I ended up in this Christian youth group. But the Christian youth group was so screwed up. I, I ended up with another youth group in the same town. And I started seeing things like we went to a hall and everybody was crying. Everybody was standing in, in groups and they were all praying and they were all crying. And I was like, why aren't I crying? And then I went to a water baptism and I saw them getting baptized and my cousin got baptized and she passed out in the, in the spirit in the water. And I didn't know what that meant. I just thought, oh, someone better call an ambulance because you know, this, this don't look right. And so I got to see these little things. I witnessed prayer from my nana. I witnessed tongues from my grandparents, you know, going into the church and they're talking this freaky language and we're mocking them and mimicking them, you know, thinking it's absolutely funny. And now today, I love praying in tongues. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite funny. Isn't it amazing how God can just flip it? Like he can just change yeah. our heart. Like that's it. Yeah. He, he takes that heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh. Yes. Is so that something I, it was, you experience? Well, it was, it was crazy watching all these people giving their lives to Christ, um, watching these girls that I go to school with and they're writing in journals and reading the Bible and I just can't click. I can't just do what they're doing. I'm not getting anything out of this. Mm. And so, um, yeah, it didn't work for me. But in saying that, 
when I was 19, uh, I just remember one week, I just really wanted to go to church. And I, I was the type of person, when I say I'm going to do something, I do my best to see it through. So I went to a party the night before. Actually, I got dragged to a party. And then I found my way home. I was half, I will tell you, I was still half drunk. And I made my way to church. And then I felt this thing inside me trying to run. Worship was loud. And I it felt like this gremlin was running around inside me. And I could hear it loud in my ears. And it was saying, get out of here. Get out of here. But it seemed like the closer I tried to get to the door, the further away the door got. And then I had a panic attack. But then something happened. I was standing there, my eyes were shut, and everything in my mind was still. I'd never experienced this in my life because my mind was always clocking over. And it was still, there was this light and there was this warmth I'd never experienced before. And this is what I heard audibly as I'm talking to you. Now you know I forgive you for all your sins. Now no one, no one knew that in my mind, by the time I was 19, I had committed some foul sins. And that was my my thing. God will never forgive me for the sins I've committed. God will never, he'll never forgive me for the sins I committed. And I heard him as audibly as I'm talking to you. Now you know I forgive you for all your sins. And it was just so, so still. And then I went home. My cousin threw me a cigarette and I heard this voice again. You don't need that. But because I didn't know this voice, there was no one to help me out. No one to tell me what I was hearing. I grabbed the cigarette. I smoked it. I heard that voice audibly for two weeks. Wow. Two weeks. That was it. And then, um, you know, I had an episode with my cousin. We had a fight, at, kind of a fight, disagreement. And uh, and then my mum, she just stood there and she goes, you'll never change. You'll never change. You're still a liar and things like that. And I got so angry that I swore back. And then that was it. I never, ever heard that voice like that again. Wow. Yeah. It was almost, it was like um, like a visitation, do you think? Uh, or like, do you think it was the Holy Spirit? Or do you think it was like the Lord, like just clearly speaking to you? I believe that it was the Lord clearly speaking to me because no one could even know that. No one could even know the questions that I had in my head. No Mm -hmm. one. And Mm -hmm. I didn't trust anyone to tell them how I feel. You know, so for God to audibly say to me, now you know I forgive you for all your sins. Mm -hmm. I knew right then and there I was forgiven. I knew right then and there there's a God and he's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we talk a little bit about... um, what started I suppose the journey into your criminal act activity should we talk oh, yeah. a little bit about that yeah sure because so I know that um it was around the time when you turned 15 was it that you started to uh get a little bit of independence and start buying yeah. your own clothes and things like that do you want to share about that um, no, I never bought my own clothes because I never had money to buy my own clothes. So I would steal. Um, oh, so I would okay. Lift. Yeah. So once a month I would shoplift to get my clothing. Once a month I would go and shoplift from the local dairy to get my toiletries and stuff. But um, yeah, when I was 15, I was already getting arrested. I was, um, I started shoplifting when I was seven. And I remember I had my first encounter with um, authority and I remember swearing my head off because it was where my nana worked. My nana worked at New Worlds um, in Edgecombe. And I and I just knew if she finds out I'm in trouble. So I just started swearing at the person who ended up being my nana, my nana's friend for years and years. And she let me go. So I went back, I sat in the car, my dad never found out, I never said anything. And then I was when I was eight, I had my first ride in a police car. And so uh, I got done for shoplifting again in Fakatani. And my dad, my dad's punishment was he made, he took me back and made me apologize to the shop owner. And that was worse than stealing. Um, and then my name ended up in that shop until I was in my early 20s. <laughs> oh, wow. You make one, you do one delivery when you're eight years old. <laughs> yeah, when the Hard owners changed, when the owners changed, they took the they took that sign or they took that list out of the shop. Yeah, I've seen those lists. My name's still in there. And then, um, so 14 was the first time I ever uh, um, used a check that didn't belong to me. And so I committed fraud. And it was it was only for like $14. I just wanted to see if I could do it. And it worked. And so in between my shoplifting um, and 
um, robbing people's clotheslines because my mum never bought me any any undergarments. My mum never bought me any clothes that was dipping into her beer money. Um, it was worse enough she had to buy me school shoes. And even then, that was a struggle. Um, but I had a sister, and my sister always got better things than me. So I was always jealous of her. I was always envious of her. She was two years younger than me. Um, at 14, my mum let her get a tattoo. My mum let her get a tongue pierced. And I was sitting there watching. Why, why couldn't I get any of that, you see? So my mum would love on my sister, but she wouldn't love on me. And then... So my sister would always get the best of everything. So I had to go and rob everything to get what I needed. And so, yeah, that's where it started. Um, even going to the nightclubs, I started clubbing when I was 15. I started going to the pub when I was 12. So I would go around and I would rob people's, um, you know, uh, purses. I would go um, into the clubs and where you store your jackets and stuff. And I would rob those things. Uh, if we go to house parties, I would rob those things. And I became a compulsive thief. And I couldn't help myself. Um, my family knew, so they would always warn people before I came, watch out, my daughter's a thief, watch out, my sister's a thief. And uh, I just couldn't stop. Every little shiny thing, I was like a magpie. Every, everything was attractive. And if I wanted it, I will just grab it. Even when I didn't want it, I would still take it. Mm. And I don't know, I, I think it was because of that whole poverty mentality. We were so poor. We were so poor that we didn't even have a front door to our house. It was a ranch slider. And the 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 round um wheel things that uh, help it roll the rollers yes. they had worn out and then the windows smashed and it was just a frame a frame with no windows and so in winter they would just wrap it in a tarp and just place it against the wall and that was how we spent our, our winters wow so it, it sounds like what started out as like survival necessity no one is clothing you no one is were you getting fed? Is it was it the same thing with food as well? Oh no! So um, so the one thing about my parents is they were always put a hot meal on the table. There was always a hot meal. There was always food, um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But um, like you know, my dad, my dad was really handy. Like he was a jack of all trades, master of none, and he would whip up a couple of bread, you know, some scones, and that was our bread. But then I used to laugh because you know all our uh, Pakia friends wanted to swap our moldy bread and our fried bread and our scones, you know, for their uh, awesome club sandwiches and food <laughs> rolls. <laughs> yes, I love the <laughs> like, bread. You, yeah, they're like, oh, can you bring these tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's always great to do trades at lunchtime. <laughs> I started robbing local businesses. Um, and then my mum moved out. So my mum and my brother moved out and suddenly it was me and my dad and I had a blast. My friends were allowed to come over. Um, if my dad needed something, I would go and steal it. Yeah, things like that. But then my mum moved home and I was devastated. Oh, no. <laughs> I was so broken. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah. So it, it started out as like a necessity, like a, I need to clothe myself. Um, yeah. And then it, it progressed to I, I believe you we when we talked earlier you were talking about those uh the vans that used to drive around and they would have like trendy fashionable clothes and you would just sign a document that said yes I'm going to pay it or here's my account number I'm not sure exactly how it worked but then the interest rates were huge and so when yes. did you first start visiting those vans I started visiting those when I was 15 and um yeah and everyone was like oh just sign up like it's all good like they give you a credit limit so you can spend like six hundred dollars and you've just got to pay like fifteen dollars a week and I was like oh yeah I can do that oh that sounds really awesome next minute I've got all these trendy clothes and labeled stuff and and I'm feeling on top of the world but then um they were like oh just don't pay it and all good you can sign up with someone else and then that's where I first started getting into debt that is where I first started making those mistakes Mm. so how how did that progress from from those vans oh okay so from those vans so I would so now I started racking up bills mm. so I and then suddenly I stopped using my name so I would um even rent you know I'd, I'd go and go and rent a house stop paying the rent I would go and um hook up with power stop paying the power you know things like that and that's mm -hmm. where it started. That's where I started getting into debt. You know, you can ring up and get a phone account, get a phone, get a landline, and then stop paying. But I've got mm -hmm. a phone. 
mm. but all this debt is accumulating and accumulating. Yep. Mm. And you had different names, like you said, you yes. stopped using your real name. Yep. yep, stopped using my real. I I couldn't even tell you the amount of names I used. There were many, many thousands, mm. thousands, thousands of different names. Yeah. Mm. So my thing was identity fraud. Yeah. And so that's when you 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 would find someone's driver's license, grab someone's driver's license or a credit uh, yes. card. How would you do that? Um, so in all sorts of different ways. So um I remember I belonged to a gym and I went into the gym and there were they had all the sign-ups. And I took a whole box of sign-ups and I started using those IDs for because it had everything it had their birth you know birth it had their names their addresses and every all the details you needed to open accounts to yeah that way that was one mm. of the things I did mm. all yeah. right so let's make sure the gyms keep that information in a safe <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what town I'll tell you what town what gym <laughs> no, let's not do that <laughs> yeah but yeah so that that was how I started even I'd find ID or you know um, my friends and I would go to the clubs and we would mm. hook up with people and we would steal their IDs yeah wow. wow especially if they were international so if they were international that was even better because then we'd never see them again and it would never ever come back to us that's yeah. like the, uh, have you heard the expression honey trap that's like literal honey trap have you heard of that yes <laughs> so that's exactly what it was and that that was why we yeah we went in with that. Well, I went in with that in mind. I don't know about everyone else, but mm. I went in with that in mind. I always had an ulterior motive. Someone said to me, you know, when you're an opportunist, where there's an opportunity, there you are. And I said, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was an opportunist. Mm -hmm. And so when did you um, have your first child? Were you quite young or had you settled down and did you have no. a partner? No, I fell pregnant when I was 16. So um, I just I just fell into suit with you know with everyone else, and I was very popular, and in school I was very popular, and uh, we we just followed suit, and so I remember I had a friend she had triplets at fifteen, wow, and another wow. another guy I knew Rod uh, oh his first name's Roger, but um he had twins at 15, 14, 15. So they were having children, very, you know, it was a normal thing to have sex um, outside of marriage. So, um, yeah, we just, everybody was doing it. So I just fell into line. And so I um, I met the guy. So I met the guy and, uh, yeah, and then I ended up pregnant. And his mum, when I gave birth to him, his mum requested a DNA and that just peed me off. I was so angry. And I just thought, you know what, screw you. And so um, my son be, fell victim to being a fatherless father. Though he was raised by my dad, and uh, he, he will always class my dad as his dad, um, I gave my son his dad when he was five because my son said to me, Mum, why is it that all, where is my dad? Everybody else has their dads. Where's mine? And so that was my pursuit. And, okay, then I'll find your dad. And him and his, yeah, he loves his dad very much. His dad loves him and they have a great relationship. Mm. To the so, so he sees his grandfather as his dad yeah and so that yes. I suppose that that's that's like fungi is that kind of how you would describe it um yes so my my parents took on uh, my parents had smartened up a little bit so they took on my they took on uh, both my sons so I um, had a, <clears throat> I had a, um, I had one son when I was 16, I was 17, shy of 17, and then I had another son shy of being 21, and my parents raised them because they used to, th they used to threat for them, oh, threat, sorry, not threat, threat for my, for my parents, and then they would threat for my brothers and sisters, so it was only natural that, um, yeah, I just said, you know what, you guys are going to have to take these kids, because they just cry and cry and cry, and so that's where they wanted to be, so that's how my parents came to raising my two sons. Mm. And you said that your parents had kind of cleaned themselves up at that point. Um, how did that happen? Um, I think my dad just, I think they just got older and realized that the way that they were, they were living was wrong. And I was always at my mum, you know, like my mum would try and bring up my past and I'll tell her, you don't have, the, you don't, you don't have the right to talk about my past. You know, and there, there were certain things, th certain boundaries I'd put up that my mum couldn't cross and um and I knew that was hard for her and uh it wasn't until my dad 
three days before my dad passed away in 2013 that I ended up with a relationship with my mother and was out of seeing her vulnerable for the very first time in my whole life. Oh. Hmm. And so did there was a reconciliation, was there? No, it wasn't a reconciliation. It was the start of a relationship. Because, <laughs> you know, to me, she was just my egg donor. <laughs> she, you know, and uh, and I, I I asked her, I said, Do you did you hate me? Were you jealous of me because you know I was daddy's girl? Like, and she said, No, I just I don't know. No, I wasn't jealous of you. And I said, Oh, then why did you treat me the way you, that you did? And she said, I don't know. Yeah. So I suppose that's a journey that's going to be going for a while, is it? Oh, no. So, um, no. so uh, once I came to Christ, um, I, w I forgave my mum and I, I did it through reading a book. And the book was uh, called Supernatural Healing of Forgiveness by Chris Vallotton. And it was through an exercise that he was doing with somebody. So I thought, I'll go through that exercise while I'm studying. And so I went through the exercise of doing the exercise, you know, and then I did exactly what it said, and I just started wailing. And then in the book, he said, it's okay to say, it's okay to yell out. You can scream, yell, of uh, what you think was unfair. And these were the words I heard coming out of my mouth. I could not fit my dad's shoes. It was, you wrecked my, you you took my childhood. I was not a growing up. They were not my kids. You took my childhood from me. And I found these things coming out of my mouth and I forgave my mum. And so about three days later, I was able to catch up with her. And I said, hey, mum, I've forgiven you. And she said, what? And I said, oh, I just want you to know I've forgiven you. I've got to go. The next morning, the next day she came over and she said, when um, I've got something to say. And I said, what's that? She said, I just want you to know that I'm so sorry for everything I did to you. She said, it was done to me. I thought it was okay. And I said, it's okay, mum. I said, look, talk about my past. And she brought up, you know, talk, talked about our past. And I said, see, look, nothing. Yeah, and she just started crying. Isn't, isn't God just so good? You know, like, I think about, you know, the, the things that I have to forgive in my life and the, the people who have wronged or hurt me in my life. And, you know, it, it really pales in comparison to what you had to deal with and what you had to forgive with your mom like it's it's insurmountable really but yet Christ did that work in your life and in your heart to be able to forgive and like you were just smiling just then when you said oh I've forgiven you you're so light and so free about it and that I mean I feel like that's evidence of God you know like that is absolute yeah. evidence of the work of God Yes, absolutely. Well, that's an interesting thought. And here's another. If you'd like to help our podcast grow, maybe consider becoming a member of our Patreon community. Membership starts at just $3 a month. Not only will you be helping us to encourage more New Zealand Christians to live their faith outside of Sunday, but as a member, you'll receive access to full episodes right away. No more waiting for next week. And also exclusive content. Just click support the show in the show notes. And now back to the episode. Yes, absolutely. Because I hated my mother. I hated her, you know, but I remember, I remember growing up, I remember as a teenager, someone said to me, you're always moaning about your mum, like, you know, mum this, she this, she that, um, she said to me, uh, you know what, maybe if you just get over it, you can move forward, and I was like, oh, and, and then you know, I, I actually heard myself, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I am, and so, you know, there was so much bitterness, so much hate, so many offences I had towards my mum, and um, yeah, and I just, I let them go. I forgave her. You know, I made the choice to forgive. We have a choice. We can either choose to hold on or we can choose to let go. I chose to let go. I chose to get over it. I chose to release those things. Because the word says, come to me, those who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. So, you know, I exchanged that burden for his yoke. Mm -hmm. His yoke is and easy. And now it's light. It's yep. easy. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the yeah. Lord. I'm just... it's, my, it's my mum now. So when I have to speak at conferences and stuff, my mum, she sits right at the back and, you know, and I, she says, why do you always have to talk about me when? And I said, because you're part of the reason why I ended up where I am, mum. I said, you know, you should be happy. You're helping change people's lives. Mm -hmm. What happened, happened, mum. But, you know, they're not holding it against you because you're not the only one that's been through that. And so, you know, and so I purposely say, um, because everyone's, you know, jaws are touching the ground and they're like, whoa, we can't believe that, you know, your mum could do that. And I'm like, oh, well, if you're wondering, there's my mum. 
She's right at the back. She's the one with the cake. Yeah. Go <laughs> ask her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody wave to my mum. And my mum, you know, she's like. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I even ended up with a spiritual mum. I ended up with a spiritual mum for a season because, and my mum gave me her blessing because my mum said to me, when I am not where you are, and the and I don't have the right advice that I could possibly give you, but they do. So, Mum, so you have my blessing to have a spiritual mum. I was like, oh, cool, Mum. <laughs> That's good. I think we all yeah. need spiritual parents. So I know we talked briefly uh, a moment ago about fungi with your two sons who went to live with your your mum and your dad, and now they see uh, them as mum and dad. Um, but you're still in your life. A, a lot of the listeners, because we do get international listeners, they won't be familiar at all with the concept of fungi. So could you just explain that for our listeners? Yeah, so fungi means um, having someone else raise your children within your family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how did you find that? Like, how did your boys find that? Was that a, a positive thing for you? Like, you were still in, were you still in their life? Yeah, yeah, it was always in their lives. It was just normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so even to the point where they they started calling me um, by my first name because all my siblings called me by my first name, so they just followed suit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. But uh, when, I, when I had my first son, I went through prenatal depression and I stayed in my room for almost nine months. I just, yeah, I struggled really, really bad. And then when I gave birth, I thought, wow, I finally have something to call my own because I had nothing. I finally had someone I could call my own, something that belonged to me. And then when I come back from hospital, everyone wanted to hold him. I said no. And then my parents, because I was only I was only shy of 17, my parents uh, went against me and they gave him out so everyone could hold him. And it was the worst feeling in the world. Mm-hmm. And then my parents were still beating me. I was a mum now. My parents are still beating me up. They were still doing it. They were still beating me, yeah, absolutely. And I went to, I was, I wanted to walk to the mall because the mall was only like a two minute walk, and I wanted to walk to the mall to go and get some diapers and stuff. And my dad swore at me and he said, "You're not going anyway. I'll go and get what you need." And then um, I said, "Wow, look at you!" And I, I said something. And then my dad came in and punched me up. And then my mum came in and punched me up. And uh, yeah, and so I, I just nothing was changing on my mum now like I've given you a grandchild and even his name it was a fight for his name my mum did the standovers because she didn't want him to have the last name that I had chosen yeah and so mum did the standovers which is how he ended up with the last name he has what do you mean by did the standovers oh, she, you said that she, she said over my dead body she said if you choose that I want to punch your head in mm. yeah yeah mm. so I had no choice I had to I didn't want to get my head punched in so Hence why he has the name he has now, which I have no regrets now, you know. Back then I, I was a 17-year-old. Um, and then um, it was my sister, so I had two black eyes, and my sister said to me one day, we're sitting there, she said, sis, pack all your stuff, go. And I said, what? And she said, pack all your stuff. She said, it's only going to get worse. And uh, so, yeah, she I just grabbed um, the little things that we needed, and then um, I went to Women's Refuge. So there was someone in the town that I knew, and I rung her, and I, she agreed to meet me um, at the mall, the local mall in Edgecombe. And so I went down with my son. I said my goodbyes to my sister. And it was because of her that I left. And so, um, yeah, my son and I started this journey. So we ended up in the women's refuge, a woman's refuge in Fakatani. And then we were mm-hmm. flown up to Auckland and um, started our lives at Bernardo's in uh, Mangere. Wow, those are fantastic organisations. Women's Refuge is amazing. Women's uh, Refuge is amazing. Bernardo's as well. I remember being 16 and I did volunteering at Bernardo's in high school. Bernardo's is amazing. Mm, mm, They gave me a home. They gave a roof of my head. They they taught me how to cook. They taught me a whole bunch of things. Yeah. And then we had to leave. And so suddenly I had to find somewhere to live. I moved in with my mum's sister and it wasn't any better. And that was in Auckland? And that so, was in Auckland. Mm, that was in mm. Auckland, yeah. And so after you left Bernardo's and, you know, such a great situation, and then now, obviously, it doesn't last forever. That's the thing, eh? How did you provide for your babies? In all sorts of ways. In all sorts of ways. So I was hustling. I was doing whatever I could, um, yeah, for my son. 
but I because you know I was I didn't it was one thing to raise my siblings like I had raised them from birth I knew all of that stuff but it's another scenario when you got your own and so my son ended up sick I didn't know I knew something was wrong with him and I just knew I needed to go home to my mum and so I ended up making my way home to my mum and I asked her can you take him she said yeah and so she ended up taking him and he ended up sick for my he ended up being sick for months I remember for months but you know I just wasn't in a good place to be able to I got him sick so what can I do for my son you know mm. and uh, so my mum took over yeah mm. Mm. and it was she all right at that stage like was, or was she going to be abusive to your baby she wasn't abusive with my baby she was abusive with me because that's something else that you said is that it seems to be specific to you like your sister you were saying yeah. um she got all she got a tattoo, her mum took her, you know, your mum took her to get a tattoo, she got her tongue pierced, she seemed to get clothes, and she was mm. loved in a way, so it was isolated towards you, was it? Yeah, and my mum used to always say to me, uh, why can't you be more like your sister, why can't you be more like your sister, because my sister was honest, my sister was loyal, I was none of those things, she was responsible, I wasn't responsible, and um, yeah, so I was just a, I was just a drunk, Yeah. I was just about partying my life away. Coming up next week on the Outside of Sunday podcast. But when I had to fully give up alcohol for the, you know, like knock it on the head completely, it was like I was giving up meth all over again. Um, I actually used her ID um, in fraud. <laughs> and, and anyway, it came back to me. So I ended up going to court and what, and what have you. And then um, I met her in church during revival. And I. Oh, and- me i stole your identity <laughs> yeah 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 and i said and you know and i felt so bad i went up to her and i said look i really have to say this i'm so sorry and, she, and we both had, we both had a good laugh about it but she ended up becoming one of my dearest friends so and in I- towns you have black market loan sharks and what they do is you can get a loan so they will give you up to whatever you want but um you've got to pay it back with 15 percent interest sometimes 25 percent interest and so you'll find that people that are on a benefit will go and loan from them. And then by the time they pay them back the following week, guess what? They've got no more money, so they've got to loan again. My, I, no, I remember just falling down on my floor, leaning over my bed, and I just I just started repenting. And I just started repenting everything. I was there for most of the day. I had so much to repent of. And I was searching every corner, every nook and cranny of my heart to find out what I needed to repent of. And then I felt different after that. So that's where everything started changing. So- Congrats, you made it to the end of this episode of the Outside of Sunday podcast. Thanks for the support. Become an official outsider by liking and subscribing and leaving a five-star review. If you'd like to connect with the podcast, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Outside of Sunday podcast. And don't forget to let someone you know know about this podcast.